Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again, listeners. You know, I always appreciate you giving me some of your time. I know today is also going to be worth it. I probably say that every week. But with me today is Dr. Crystal Culler. She is with the Virtual Brain Health Center. And we are going to be discussing how to promote brain health in memory care. And as you guys all remember, my mom was in memory care. So this is a really, really good topic. So thanks for joining me, Crystal. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you and your community today. I'm excited. Thank you. So why don't you give us your background and then we could talk about brain health in memory care, which is probably not something most people think about. Yeah, thank you. I think like many people probably tuning in, I have a family connection to dementia. My grandmother was nearing the end of her journey at the time I was in graduate school and I had a brain-based seizure event. My mom was navigating getting a diagnosis of MS. So women's brain health issues were at the forefront for my immediate family and those I cared about. So building off my training in gerontology and psychology of aging, I wanted to know how to build out programs and services to support people in their brain care to age well. And really at any age, brain health is so important. And that has kind of catapulted my journey into the brain health space. And I've been in that sector where we can bring together brain health within memory care and understand how that presents or looks different, but still going forward with the mantra of brain care for all. I would, when this topic was presented to me, I was like, that's not something I ever considered. And when my mom was in memory care, my goal was, you know, her best quality of life, the most joy and not prolonged dying from Alzheimer's, but trying to like maintain some of her cognitive health, just like <laughs> kind of seemed pointless at that point. At that point, she was already in advanced dementia. So um, why is it important? Yeah, I think that's a scenario a lot of people see or think about is because across the continuum with dementia, priorities and individual priorities and family members may shift. But I always think about it's the idea of wellness and quality of life. And so if we think about mental stimulation, for those of us listening now, it might be the intent of lifelong learning. We're learning something new. We can go and apply to our lives. And when we're thinking about it more down the memory care continuum, it's engagement in the moment, not necessarily with the fact you're going to remember and then repeat it again or reteach someone. It's just different expectations. And what I have found is when you really work with communities and programs that just meet people where they are cognitively. And, you know, ramp them up to where they're appropriately stimulated. And it's a different feel. At the end of the day, you're tired because you've had a stimulating day engagement. You're not tired because you're bored. And that really comes down to a great difference, I think, in quality of life. So really, it's about reframing some of the aspects where it's, you know, learning, but in a different way. Maybe it's more meaningful in the engagement. We can do reminiscence. There's lots of therapies and programs that work really well, but just the idea of that mental stimulation piece and having a conversation, how great that can be for our brain and having that workout. And so just trying to be mindful of ways we can create those opportunities and for our own selves, maybe remove the expectation that it's learning, but it's stimulation in a different way under that broader lifelong learning continuum. Well, I guess I got lucky then because it was very difficult to do activities with my mom. She was very reluctant. Um, it was kind of frustrating because she would actually do activities with other people in memory care and not me. So it was like, well, what is it about me? So I landed on taking my mom out to the park, the pool or wherever children were. And she just enjoyed watching the kids. I mean, being a mom and a grandma, that made perfectly good sense. Most of the time we were outside. So we got some sunshine, fresh air. She got out of the community. So I guess I wasn't learning per se, but it was definitely a shift in perspective and like an experience, although, you know, it didn't, it didn't look very experiential to me because sometimes she just sat there. She really liked sitting around and shooting the breeze. And she did that so well with the other residents of the memory care, <laughs> because I got tired of answering the same question repeatedly, but 
There were times I would literally take my mom and one of the other residents out and they would talk to each other and I could interject. I could enjoy their their perspective on things because we went to a regional park and there was a like basically a foot trampled path down from the picnic tables down to a trail. And it was very, very steep. It was like literally most of us would slide down on our buns. And they talked about that stupid path for 20 minutes. And I was like, I'm so glad they're talking to each other. But it was it was interesting because they'd bring up like, well, the boys would probably go down, but the girls probably wouldn't. And, you know, the just the comments were really interesting. And people thought I was nuts. They're like, you took both of them out? I'm like, yeah. And you brought them both back? I'm like, yeah, the ranger was right there. <laughs> I couldn't leave them in the regional park. That I would have gotten found out. Oh, and I appreciate you sharing that because, you know, those are all the essence of, of brain health, those components, that connection, the socialization, the benefits of being out in nature when you really, you know, if you're in a community, you might not be able to access that as readily. And so probably didn't know that, but you were doing all these different things that were fantastic for her well-being as, as well as yours. As you, like you said, you're navigating the dynamics of that relationship changing with where they are with their diagnosis and still creating those moments to, to spark joy and connection. Yeah. She, she really actually thrived in memory care. She, you know, never wanted to go there. She wanted to live in her home forever, but she didn't want to be a burden to me. Okay. Well, those are mutually exclusive. Thanks. Thanks so much for that choice. And when my dad was on hospice and he'd been in the hospital for a month and my mom bounced around between my house and her home with her sister, her younger sister would be there to, you know, take care of her. And it just, it was really obvious. I'm like, mom is not coming to live with me because after a week, one or both of us would be dead. She didn't respect me as an adult in charge of my own household that could make decisions and have expectations for her. Um, Cause she was, even though she thought I was her best friend, she still knew somehow knew like in a home setting that she was my mom. So it was like, that was not going to be an ideal situation. My listeners know I'm, you know, a retired portrait photographer. My studio was attached to my house. I would have had to hire a caregiver to, you know, make sure she was safe during the day so my husband and I could do our job. I'm like, this is just not going to work. <laughs> She's like, I can't deal with all of this insanity and try to do my stuff. So um, memory care was the right choice. And I was really surprised that, you know, she had friends. She got into mischief. She did things with other people, like I said, she wouldn't do with me. <laughs> so. Well, and I appreciate you kind of sharing that experience, mainly because it's not a decision people make readily or very easily. But you may hear a lot of people say, once someone gets in this memory care environment, they're thriving in a different way, mainly because they've reached a setting that meets them where they are in environmental needs and, and programming and staffing. And sometimes there's a limit to what we can do within our own means in our homes, our household, our family context. But I remember hearing people say, well, when they got into memory care, they've been here a while longer than we thought. And it's just kind of this shift in their health and well-being. And then we can figure out for ourselves how we now navigate with them in that space. And we get to see them sometimes in a different light of conversating with someone else. And you're like, this is just a very interesting conversation to to hear. And then we get to have those moments with them too. And so I think there's a great value at times when we really can see the behaviors and environment and programming, just, just meet people and still spark the essence of themselves for them. That makes sense. So my mom was completely ambulatory unaided until she fell on March 8th, 2020 and broke her leg, which precipitated, oh boy, tongue doesn't want to work, precipitated um, her passing. So it was, it wasn't super easy to take her to the park because she walked very slowly. She walked behind me. She watched her feet. She would not be arm in arm with me. Listeners know all this story. I mean, she, I have a past guest that came to the conclusion that because my mom was the oldest of four siblings, she walked behind me so she could keep an eye on the kids, which I really wish I'd known. My mom was still around because it was so frustrating. I was always afraid that she would trip over her own feet or the crack in the sidewalk or, you know, how we all end up doing something silly and just face plant in the cement. And, you know, the greater world was just going to think I was a horrible monster because I didn't 
let her catch up or I didn't hold her hand or, you know, do anything to help her. But she refused all those things. So it wasn't easy to go to the park, but it was worth it because it was just better for both of us in the long run. But if you've got somebody who is much more challenging to take out of the community or maybe the taking them out of the community causes them, you know, duress, what what suggestions do you have for helping them with experiences and lifelong learning like within the community? Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at what's available in that environment or or programming in it. To some extent, we know our loved ones the best if we have their history and we've had a close relationship. So how can we work with staff to spark ideas or to also know of, like you shared earlier, they're showing up a little different now that they're here. They're engaging with someone else and different than me, but how can we find those ways to engage? Some of it involves the reminiscent therapy. Some of it's trying something new. And I remember thinking of that with my family as well is conversations look very different depending on who was in the room. And my relationship with my grandmother was very different than my mother and my aunt who did most of the direct care. It was kind of the second level. If they had a had an issue, it was like I could come in because I could say the same things or try the same interventions. And it just landed different being a granddaughter than a daughter. And so recognizing how different factors may be at play, but also the way we can all play a different role. And, you know, for some of my cousins, I know it was just learning that, like we all do with the journey is it doesn't matter if she knows our name, what she calls you when she's in there. If you're still able to connect, we still know, welcome, love, compassion. And it's kind of removing some of the typical expectations we would think. Uh, but we, we learn those different strategies and toolkits. And I think many of us know is there are probably times we didn't do the cliche right thing in the moment, but now we've learned and we've adapted. And that's all a journey that we all take, providing support for a loved one, doing a program, as well as navigating that dynamic of, of families and communities. And we can all just get different insights together to create some rewarding experiences and, and spark memories or conversations and laughter. I was always surprised that my mom would participate in things like, you know, they would swap the balloon around, which for those of us who have, I have weird vision. Um, that's a much, I can do that. Like balls coming at me. I don't have any depth perception. So balls coming at me is not a game I'm going to play ever. It's not fun, but I can swat around a balloon, but she wouldn't do that with me, which is weird. Cause you'd think, well, it's, she would do it with her kids, but she doesn't do that with her best friend. But she would do it in the community. And so that kind of got, you know, they got your arms up higher and you, know, you got to pay attention. So it's a little bit like exercise. They claimed on there, you know, when you're making a decision which community to move them to, that they had like morning exercise. I don't think that ever happened. I think a lot of their residents were on walkers and wheelchairs. So they just kind of, they kind of let that one go. But is there, um, besides you know, smacking a balloon around. Is there other, um, like easy ways to give them physical activity? Like, ex I mean, exercise, we think of exercise as specific things. So trying to use a different term, but you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think that's the, the struggle for a lot of us, right. Is we think there's just this one prescription of exercise movement, follow this routine with these weights or these movements. And I think some of that comes back when I think about brain health and memory care is thinking about how we conceptualize exercise. And sometimes it is movement, intentional movement, or it could be just the opportunity, like you said, to navigate the space and walk around freely to, to where you're going and exploring our environment, because we may forget the movements we have in throughout our day. And if we're cleaning or things before, but now you might not have the opportunities to do that but there's other ways to move and engage within the spaces. So I think a lot of communities really will take advantage of that environment. And much like you said, movement programs start to look different. It's, you can't necessarily play a workout video by Jane Fonda or yeah. someone and expect that they're able to track it. A lot of us, even before issues, it's, it's difficult to track a movement that you're watching and trying to do it for yourself. So finding ways to add movement in or 
you know, je- more gentle movements, a lot of chair yoga, qigong, gentle stretching. And, you know, it is value that it is led by a person or a volunteer, because then we can encourage that movement. We can still have that structure and we're still able to connect and follow along to participate differently than we can if it's this video that's being played. And unfortunately, I think we've all been a part of at some place along the aging care continuum where that is the program. It, it is the video played. And this happens for a variety of reasons. But how important it is to have still that human element and component and then some of the guiding and a lot of what happens too is the time interval becomes compressed. It's not likely we're going to sit and do a 30 minute program. Maybe we will in the moment. It's, you know, group dynamics got us engaged and we want to keep going, but it's smaller intervals of intentional program and movement. And I always like to think in the back of our mind of what we're doing, there's purpose. There's purpose or intent behind it. So a lot of like you shared, if you're playing this game, it's getting your arms up above your head, it's stretching, it's it's moving something you typically are not going to do. Um, so there's this purpose and intent behind it with the idea of the outcome isn't necessarily um, gradually increasing the weight you can do. If you're thinking of strength training, it's just you have this connection, you are moving your body. So changing the expectations of that outcome as well. And for people like me who became like, I don't want to say hardcore workout person, but maybe that is true. It's when you said, oh, you know, increasing the weight, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what I do. So it is it is a little challenging. And just for the listeners, before we hit record, I was explaining that I had to do a really uh, adaptive exercise class through the Peloton this morning because Luna pitched us off our paddleboard and I twisted the crap out of my knee. So, you know, sometimes just a little movement is better than no movement. And that's what I did this morning. So. You know, I should swat around a, a balloon today or something, <laughs> get a little more movement involved. Um, but yeah, the other thing they did in in a group setting, and it really kind of surprised me um, because I, well, I never got to witness it fully, but they would read them stories. And I sometimes did that with my mom and, you know, one of the other residents that she was always hanging out with. But I would read really super short, funny stories. So, you know, like one or two pages because she had, she was advanced enough in her Alzheimer's that, you know, she couldn't track things like, you know, if we're sleepy and we're reading a book, you know, and the next day we pick it up and you're like, huh? And then you go back a few pages and like, oh, yeah, OK, that's right. That's where I was at. Or if you've put it down for a few days and then you go back to it, you're like, where was I? So that was how she was. But, you know, more in the moment. But, yeah, I was always surprising that they would just sit there and, you know, maybe they were. Maybe it was almost more of a form of meditation for them because I was always surprised that they just sat there quietly listening like attentive little students. And I was like, some of these residents are total rebel rousers. I'm shocked they're sitting here so quietly. (laughs) And I don't remember, they weren't basic books. Um, I don't remember. It's been a few years now. So it's like, ooh, okay. Um, But that's... That was another thing. They did a lot of good things, despite the, you know, the very typical, the caregivers, the paid caregivers weren't paid very well. And there was barely enough of them pre-pandemic. I can't imagine what it's like now, but they, they did as much as they possibly could. You know, they had the bingo where you covered all of the spaces. So you didn't have to worry about diagonals and other lines, you know, up and down. I haven't played bingo in a long time. They had puzzles. They did coloring a lot. My mom didn't participate in the coloring because she couldn't decipher between inside the lines and outside the lines. And she was always afraid of doing something wrong. That was the really tricky part. But yeah, they were pretty good at engagement. But like I said, my mom liked to just sit around and shoot the breeze. (laughs) Yeah, and there's some wonderful programs. I'm fortunate. My husband, we have two grandparents in their 90s. And they still go to the local senior center. And we always joke because Mama will go for like the fitness program and Pat Pat goes and sits for the socialization. And, you know, you don't want to discredit that because if you visit him afterwards or even a couple of days, the uplift in his spirit, what he's telling you about people he has to connect with, it's, it's just so different than a conversation you have when you're a couple living at home or you get occasional visitors versus when you can go out 
and be around here. So we had to learn that we would joke that you'll get him there for the lunch, but it was more about the people. And so realizing just these different ways we can connect and how it does have that benefit for our brain, whether it's, I don't know if you've ever had someone read you a story, but if you go into some of the people who have the theater and the drama background, it's like, why have I not had someone read me a story before it creates this different experience in the room and the connections that we can have or the conversations that it can spark. And so sometimes it does, it sounds so simple and a little off the beaten path. And then when I've done a program, even for myself, I thought, why haven't I done have, have this done before or seek this out? Because we're so used to being the one that wants to seek out the information and take it and relay it to the next person that sometimes we can just enjoy the experience and take it in. And there are some wonderful creative professionals and programs who can really tap into that much more on the emotional and engagement level and to honor the the skill set that it does and the experiences it creates for all of us who get to be in that space. That makes sense. I actually have recently started listening to meditative sleep podcasts, but they're stories. And my favorite one is titled Nothing Much Happens, where the um, host of the show writes and reads her stories where, quote, nothing much happens. And when you listen to it, like, literally, and I just turned another podcast host onto this, and she said, I tried it the last two nights, it works great, five minutes in and I'm out. Um, so the gal reads the story once, and then the second time she reads it through, she reads it slower. And 99% of the time, I never hear it the second time. It actually frustrates me when I get to the second time, because it means I'm still awake. <laughs> but it's, she just has these stories that they're just very simple. And I think my mom might have enjoyed them because they're also kind of short. So they're about 12 to 15 minutes. Um, the first, you know, she reads them twice. So the, sh the episodes are longer than that. But, you know, it's, she'll talk about, um, one of them was, she was this, the story is an innkeeper who was um, pet sitting. And the, you know, she's got the dog and the cat and, and she's just talking about them. And it's not like, well, the dog went out and did this and that. It's just, it's all really basic, like normal everyday life. And it's really relaxing. So I can see how, you know, like now you're making me want to go to drag, drag, what is it? Story, drag queen story hour or something like that. <laughs> Might well, have to go you to know, you think about it, it, it is programmed probably a lot of people attended when they were younger or you've taken a niece, a nephew, a, a grandchild too. I mean, story hour was a very popular program and we forget that it still has benefits. It's not just for, for young children, but how we can benefit across all ages and as well with this memory care continuum. And there's still different ways to engage and be stimulated and how nice to be afforded those opportunities. Because a lot of us, it may be available. We don't necessarily go and, and seek that out. But now we can learn like through places like here in your podcast and all the information you share, new ways to seek out and engagement and, and purpose to connect with others. That makes sense. And I think part of, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the issue is, you know, they always tell you, you know, you don't, they're not children, don't treat them like children. So you think, well, reading them a story seems very childlike. And I think that might be why some people shy away from that. Um, I did it just because I was desperate and I downloaded a short stories book, a book of short stories on my iPad. And like I said, they were funny. Most of them were funny. Some of them were slightly, uh, not raunchy, but they leaned that way, which was interesting with my mom and her friend. And because that usually sparked some kind of strange conversations, I had to be careful. <laughs> but, you know, they, they were, they were just a way to engage. And I don't think we necessarily think of that when you think of quote, reading somebody a story. So I'm, I'm glad we shared that that little bit of information because that really was rewarding. It got harder because she didn't, as she progressed, she didn't speak as much. And a lot of what she said, she was really good at um, clear English words and what sounded like fully formed sentences, but with no context. So she would say something and you'd be like trying to, I, it took me a long time to try to stop deciphering. Like, what is she trying to tell me? I tried so hard to be respectful and respond to her in a way that would make sense. And it took me forever to just give that up. It took me way too long 
I got it close to the end and then I, I didn't get to, I didn't get to very many months with just going with the flow because I was trying to be respectful. So what is there other things we should encourage in memory care, look for in the communities if we're, if we're seeking out a community for our loved one, what other, how, what other things are good to be looking for? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, I think the one is to keep in mind, you know, how are they able to individualize some programs? Because as we all know, if we get in there and we're part of a community for a couple months or a year, there still may be some changes. So thinking about how they're willing to adapt to still keep individuals engaged and support as well as with family, which I think is always an important piece because we have people, most Playbook places have people coming in and visiting and finding the different resources they have. But I always like to say, unfortunately, most of what we do is at the broader group level, but there's still ways to adapt and support individuals and how they honor those those preferences and get creative. And I like to think a lot of the communities really do find something that's a challenge and they'll put out multiple ways to get someone engaged and and ways to try. And when we know, hey, music really works for this person, okay, well, now here's this list of things we could do and suggestions. And that I think the communication piece as well from staff to family of how someone's responding, what's really resonating with them. And like you said, saying, well, it's working for mom when she's with her friend, but not when I'm in the room with her. So what are some other tools or things I can try and really try to find that balance and you kind of get that collaborative support around an individual to keep stimulation going as well as knowing if there are changes, what are some things we can still adapt? I always considered myself the captain of mom's care team. Um, because just because somebody's in memory care does not mean that your caregiving is over. You get to revert back to your relationship a lot more. Although for me, it was more friend instead of daughter, but it was still a relationship, not a responsibility as much. But I still had the responsibilities of, you know, getting her to the doctor, getting her hair cut, all of those normal things we have to do where wherever we live. So it, one of my challenges close to the end of her life is that she was getting um, really combative. And I knew she needed more purpose. And I was trying to figure out how to give her purpose without adding to the burden of the staff. And I did not f- find that solution prior to her passing. but. You could ask, you know, as family, you could ask the staff, you know, what are they enjoying when I'm not here? And then this is what I do with them when I visit. And you can kind of collaborate that way on, you know, maybe some additional things they could try, you could try, you know, you could help the staff to provide for them. You know, these are all the things I've learned since my mom passed away. (laughs) Which is why I keep doing the show, because if I'm still learning, then I'm assuming the information is still good. <laughs> yeah, it's there's a lot to learn at times. And I think it's honoring the journeys that we all have is we're learning as we go. And you can still read it in a book or hear these tips in a blog. And then when you're in real life and you're trying it, it's like it should work. 
but it's not working for my loved one. So what's the next thing? And it's so it is this space and grace to have that curiosity to keep trying something new, but then also not judging if it's really not resonating with the person we're trying to support or it doesn't fit your family dynamics. And, you know, thinking about all those pieces come together, but yet we're still trying new and different things and give ourselves the grace to say that really didn't work. It might not work that day. You could revisit it in a couple of weeks or in a month and say, okay, now they're really enjoying music. Other times they were doing art or they're fine socially being socially connected. And that's what is getting them out of their room and engaged in the community. And so it's kind of honoring how that personal preference may ebb and flow as well. I guess also not feeling like there's certain things that have to happen. You know, like you, you commented, you know, they're getting out and being social. So they're getting out of their room. And when my mom first moved in, every time I'd visit, like for the first six weeks was really rough. I, she was always in her room and then it was like a light switch flipped and the, she forgot about her previous home and everything was great. And then she was always with other residents. And so, you know, you always kind of think like, well, I should be engaging like this, or I should be trying that, or, you know, like all of these sh should do's just forget all of those. <laughs> you'll know probably if they're the best advice. Let those go. Yeah. You'll know if they're unhappy. Trust me. You'll know. <laughs> It may, they, they'll either let you know, or it, it's usually pretty obvious. You you know, you might not pick up on it immediately, but you know, after a visit or two, you'll be like, something doesn't seem quite right. So, cause I did all the reminiscence and the music and I did all that traditional advice and it all flopped just spectacularly, <laughs> but sitting there polishing her nails and polishing her friend's nails and, you know, taking them out to the regional park or um, there was one day that it was chilly, you know, or late winter, early spring. So the air was damp and it was really like March here is just windy as sin. And you don't want to be sitting in the park and the kids probably weren't in the park. So we, I thought, oh, let's go to McDonald's where there's a, you know, a, a play, whatever they call those things, the play mm -hmm. spaces and her friend, her other friend. So my mom was named Diane. Her friends were also named Diane. <laughs> So we had Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. So other, other Diane looked at me and she goes, I really need a hamburger. I'm like, okay, I guess you're coming with us. <laughs> Which worked out because there were no children at McDonald's because it was early in the afternoon. So most of them were still in school. But we, we, they had, let's see, my mom got a Diet Coke, which was, had been her favorite drink. Other, other Diane got her burger. They talked about it. The benches were really flat and really hard. So they complained about those. And then we left and it was like, they had a great time. I eh, was okay. But yeah, it was just interesting that, you know, like if my mom and I had gone, it would not have been as successful because I would have had to try to figure out how to engage with her with no children to pay attention to. And this very hard, uncomfortable bench. <laughs> it was just, it was always a challenge. It was very unfortunate when other Diane got really paranoid. And then um, originally other, other Diane looked, she looked like a visitor. Hair was meticulous. Makeup was great. She was always dressed very nicely. And then her progression was faster than my mom. So she just got really, you know, the way they end up at the end. It was just, and it, she got there faster than my mom did, which was really interesting. So because she moved in last out of the three Diane's. <laughs> it's like, they were like the three musketeers and they hung out together. It was very crazy, but it was, it was a challenge. So I think we covered how to take care of brain health and memory care. Why don't you tell us about your virtual brain health center? Cause that sounds, that sounds like something that was probably born out of the pandemic. And it sounds like something we all need anyway. It was, we did launch during the pandemic and it was building off of previous work where it was a center for brain health co-located on a senior living campus. So putting brain health in residential programming and staff trainings, and then helping putting it into community-based program, social model adult days. And how does it just show up differently in those spaces? And so our goal was really to be a one-stop shop for brain health and wellness, where people can come learn information around 
brain health, gain access to other experts that offer a musical memory care program or a creative arts program. And so really, when we look at brain health, our research can show us these risks or if we're already managing a brain-based condition or brain health-related issue, it's we want to prioritize this area of our health now. It may be our creativity. It might mean to be the music or, or the movement. But finding other companies that have products or services that you could use that are you know, vetted and being researched. So really trying to just expose people to, if this is your priority area, here's a place where you could go. And it's all across the continuum. I'm working for people, healthy aging all the way up through memory care resources for individuals living with dementia, as well as cares. And so continuing that mantra of brain care for all, but trying to be that one stop people can come and at least start to get some information and continue on their journey. So what kind of classes and things, <clears throat> excuse me, do you offer? It's like finally warmed up and now it's like so dry that even the water's not, <laughs> not quenching the dry throat today. <laughs> yeah, we offer a wide variety of brain health classes. So we kind of take each topic in brain health where we do a general de definition to physical movement, providing a chair yoga, a gentle yoga, multiple fitness programs, to then breaking down concepts like cognitive engagement, resilience, how do we set smart goals? So really trying to make them that give you the evidence behind it and then the action steps on each of these topics so they don't become so overwhelming and you can find different ways to keep nurturing your own personal brain health and wellness path. That sounds excellent. I think the pandemic kind of taught us that we all need to pay more attention to that, but you know, that was such an upheaval in everybody's lives that a lot of people just like, they're so glad to be, quote, back to normal, whatever that looks like, that, you know, they might have forgotten about some of those best practices we were trying to incorporate into our lives during the pandemic. Um, that's when I got my Peloton like the rest of the world, <laughs> one of those yeah. people. And it's great, but, you know, there's so much more to do than just physical exercise or, you know, like I said, I, I am... I'm seriously, I cannot meditate. It drives me bananas. I can't shut my brain off. The to-do list scrolls through. That's why I like the meditative story reading podcasts at bedtime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it helps if there's somebody that can kind of guide you through some of these learning, you know, like here's what, here, like you said, here's the research behind it and here's the steps to take it. That's That's exactly how I need to learn things. Yeah, well, and I think you hit one of the ones that's very difficult for people where someone's like, go meditate. There's hundreds of types of meditation or breath work and sound and movement meditations, and it can get very complicated. So where can you come and, you know, like you said, gain exposure or guidance to one particular practice and experience a few times if it works for you. Great. You add it in. And like you said, if it's not working for you on to the next thing, I, I know personally, one of the meditations that's helpful for me is binaural beats. It's sound engineered. So you're listening to your headset, you're listening to music, and you're reaping some benefits without realizing it. And I thought, well, that's great compared to telling me to sit and hold a stance and stand, stare at an object in a room and breathe. I need to really practice to do that. But it's to honor that there's all these different types of ways to breathe or try different aspects of brain health. And some of it's that curiosity to keep exploring. And then the other is, like you said, this is a great foundational pillar that is part of my routine. I know I can use this at night to help me fall asleep. Now that might not be a concern for you. So you can flip to some other aspect of your brain health where you'd like to find a tool or strategy that can keep you feeling good. My, my favorite two meditative um, things that I do, walk the dog. Um, like I said, I live in the, the Sierra foothills. So it's pine trees and oak trees and deer and critters. <laughs> so we go out towards sunset when the golf course is closed and it's okay to walk on the course. And I don't, I take my phone, but I don't, I don't listen to any podcasts. I don't listen to any music. I just go. Part of the reason I don't do that is because the neighbors like to talk. So there's some social engagement, but if we don't run across any neighbors that want to, you know, strike up a conversation, you know, you can watch the changing light, the trees, you know, sometimes there's clouds. Um, occasionally you'll round a corner and it's like, oh, there's a whole bunch of deer. And they 
they know they own the joint, so they'll stare you down. And even with a 75 pound golden retriever, they let you get pretty close before they're like, oh, nope, we're out of here. And then they run off. And it's, you know, when you're looking at an animal's eyes, like a wild animal, a deer that's taller than me, and they're standing on a hill. So it's like, eek, <laughs> not messing with you. You know, sometimes they stroll through my yard and I'll see them out of the corner of my eye in my office. And it's like, oh, okay, just a deer. It's crazy. And like the birds, we have hummingbirds. Um, sometimes I just sit out there in the morning and just listen to the variety of birds. It, it would be easy to, if you're not focusing on it, to hear it as kind of noise because there's so many different bird sounds. But when you just sit there and just listen, it's like, wow, it's really pretty cool. And then I like to make handmade greeting cards. So it's, it's something that you have to, you know, you have to put your mind to it. You got to pay attention to what you're doing, but it's, you get so absorbed in the process that you just, you know, the next thing you know, you're like, why am I so hungry? Oh, it's been four hours. <laughs> Those are my, that, and I like paddle boarding out on the lake when the dog doesn't fling me into the water surprise suddenly, because it's really calm. Just, you know, you get out there and you get a different perspective of your neighborhood. That I find that to be really beneficial, just like a different perspective. Um, the dog that you could tell when she's bored and she just needs to go out and see something other than the same walls. And we're all like that. So it's it's good. So how do people find out? Is it Virtual Brain? What's the website? I could almost remember. <laughs> yeah, it's just we're, we tried to keep it simple. VirtualBrainHealthCenter.com. That's what I thought, but I'm like, I couldn't remember if the center was in there. And, um, when we talked briefly about the classes, like how approximately, pro Lord, approximately how many kind of different classes do you have? Like, can you give us like some topics, get people interested? Yeah, we do some ongoing fitness classes once a week, at least chair yoga, breath work, meditation. And then what we have found that works really well is throughout the year, we do some brain day. Event. So we have a, a stress day that comes up in the fall where we hone in on stress and some tools to combat it. We do a big blowout event in March, our annual Brain Awareness Week, usually over 10 programs with lots of collaborative partners. And then we hone in on other aspects of mental wellness and we do a summer brain boot camp. So all these different ways we get to take a deeper dive into some of these topics with, with experts and really begin to understand how we can have an influence on our brain health and help others take the charge for themselves or loved ones that they're supporting as well. Do you have any um, classes geared towards the holidays? We do. We usually do a class on managing stress around the holidays, aspects around healthy eating as well. And on our website, we do have some blogs that really tie into some of the topical themes in the fall, like your brain on fear. Uh, how does fear interact with your brain and those types of things and practicing a attitude of gratitude. So we have some additional resources that are some quick reads or references with actionable steps of what you can do to incorporate gratitude into your day-to-day -day life as well. I have an addition to the daily gratitudes, which I try to do. I learned that a long time ago, but recently, and I can't remember if it was a past guest or something I read, but is to also on a daily basis. So like maybe as you're preparing for bed or maybe as you're winding down in the evening is, you know, think back over your day and, th and find something that you can be proud of yourself for. Did you get your whole to-do list done? Great. You know, did you get some extra stuff done? Did you not freak out when there was the explosive poop accident? Um, or, you know, you have a technical issue. I was trying to do some LinkedIn lives and that's been a like, pfft stupid challenge but you know you, instead of just letting it crush you did you just adapt and move on did you know did you figure it out so there's always something we can be you know be, we can be proud of ourselves for having accomplished or not you know not let somebody make us angry or just you know there's a lot of a lot of things in our daily life that we should be we should appreciate that we navigate well and i think giving ourselves that credit on a daily basis in addition to saying, you know, I'm really grateful for, you know, the beautiful place I live, the crazy hummingbirds that entertain me regularly, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it just really kind of helps you kind of, you know, 
focus on yourself in a positive way, which, you know, most of us, we're really good at tearing ourselves down. So this is a, find a way to bring yourself up every day, even if it's just something simple. It's like, I got through today, <laughs> period. Yeah. Well, in the, one of the ways we bring that before in, in some of the groups we talk about is on those days that are really tough and trying, we all have them, it looks or presents different, but thinking about what went well. And there's some days where you might need to ask yourself that at lunchtime because you're having a morning. But if you can kind of take that time and reflect and think, well, these things went well. Now you can start to kind of shift the positivity a little bit more for your afternoon. But that's been another way that I have learned that has been useful for people to help to reframe. And for many of us, we know those days. We probably can't always <laughs> articulate them as well as we'd like, but we know that day. And if we can do those quick little shifts, and like you said, practice that gratitude, just focus on something that did went, go well instead of the three to five things that did not go our way. And then, like you said, reflect back on some of it of years ago, most of us would not have known how to troubleshoot you you know, Zoom or even how to find all these podcasts that are available. But now we do. And what have we learned? So it's kind of reflecting on what did I learn today? And all that learning that has come up now, how many things you can do quickly without really much thought behind it. You're on automatic drive doing those things. And it's so easy, like when you're just having one of those days where everything is going wrong, to just focus on the quote, everything is going wrong. Well, pretty much not everything goes wrong. It just feels that way. So when you, like you said, shift your perspective, it's like, um, yes, we had an explosive incident in the bathroom, but man, we had a nice breakfast and the hummingbirds were fun. And then, you know, lunch was a disaster, but we managed to clean that, you know, just, it's like, it's so easy to, and I'm, I have had to learn this as an adult because I always had people say, why do you complain so much? I'm like, I'm not complaining, just making a statement. And so I, at one point, shifted to like, why do people hear what I'm saying as a complaint? And, you know, just really start, it's like, I think it was more where it was coming from. It was like, it was coming from like a place of frustration. So when I stopped focusing on the frustration, like one incidence was a family that was just, it's like, you really want me to take good family portraits of you? Um, did you think of maybe training these children or this adult man over here? I'm just like, so I think it sometimes came, a statement would come from that place instead of, hey, I did a pretty good job considering those children were swinging from the ceiling. <laughs> and I learned shifting that perspective made me feel better. And then people didn't hear things that I made as, quote, statements as complaints. So it's really, you know, it sounds cliche. And some of us are like, oh, yeah, focus on the positive, right? You know, it's going so well today. But when we when we do, when we do it for ourselves, like, you know, I didn't lose my cool when, you know, two years ago, I might have exploded at this person for logical reasons, but maybe not healthy ones. And, you know, you're just doing yourself a favor. It's, it's not so cliche. Yeah. And there's really times like you highlighted where we can reflect back on our growth or also if we've learned the skills to say, today's not the day I need to do my self care. It's not the day to make big decisions, you know, give ourselves some time or on days that are just challenging and say, it's okay. I'm not my best self today, but I'm going to do what I need to do to uplift me. And like you said, it might be getting outdoors, spending time with pets, but saying that's what I need to prioritize now, rather than these things on, on my list. That's more of the, the checking it off and, you know, finding those different strategies. And I think that's the one where, again, probably don't need to describe it. We've all had those days where we've checked out. And it's okay. And then how can we just re-nurture ourselves to feel better the next day, get a good night's sleep, get get into bed when we can, and and then pick up again the next day up. Many things that we think can't wait probably can. And so learning that grace and space we can have with those mind shifts, uh, the words to help shift our mind is very important. Well, I hope everybody checks out the virtualbrainhealthcenter.com. It sounds like you guys have fantastic um, resources and classes and just, you know, not just for caregivers, which I know is who we're talking to right now, but even, you know, for maybe care to care, anybody that wants to age well, but you know, we're so share, share this with your, your friends, everybody, <laughs> because we all need these kind of, you know, brain healthy learning and advice. And I really, 
appreciate Dr. Keller coming on and sharing this with us and reaching out to me and explaining to me how we can promote brain health while our loved one is in memory care. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for the conversation. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.